What's up, All Stars? Welcome to the School of Ireland live review session. This is part one in a two-part series that's going to cover the top 100 most important AP Psych FRQ terms. And so that what that means is that this video tonight is going to cover terms 100 to 51. And then the next video, which is already on my YouTube channel, it's already published to my YouTube channel, will cover the top 50 terms. So you can check that one out on my YouTube channel. And I've actually put the link in the description below. Okay, so let's charge ahead here. And let's talk about the AP Psych test a little bit. So as you probably know by now, the AP Psych test is split into two parts. You have 100 multiple choice questions worth two thirds of the test, and then you have two free response questions worth a third of the test. And one FRQ is going to be a concept application FRQ, meaning they can pull terms from any unit. And the other FRQ is going to be predominantly research design or research method based, meaning that they're going to have terms or questions dealing with things like, hey, what's the hypothesis in this study? What's the independent variable? Is this an experiment, random assignment, correlations, all that type of stuff. So the second FRQ the research design FRQ will be predominantly, if not all, research design base. And uh, with that said, sometimes they do pull terms from other units for that second FRQ. Now, before we go on, I just want to give you a heads up. I cannot promise that any of these terms that we go over tonight will show up on the AP exam FRQ this year. Um, I can't promise that. However, I am willing to bet that if you don't see these terms on the FRQ, you'll probably see some of them on the multiple choice section. So let's go to our first term. And with our first term, we're actually going to start out with a bonus term. Let me cut the music here for a second. We're going to start out with a bonus term, and that is the serial position effect. So we're not even to the top 100 terms here. Um, we got the serial position effect to kick us off, which says that people are more likely to recall the first and last information from a memorized list rather than the information in the middle. So for example, let's say that for whatever reason you don't have your phone and your parents are like, hey, we need you to go to the grocery store and for some reason you can't write stuff down and they give you a list of things to get at the grocery store. You are more likely to recall the information at the beginning and end of the list rather than the stuff in the middle. Another example might be, if someone is studying the day before a test, they are more likely to recall the next day the things they studied at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day rather than the stuff in the middle. And related to this is the term the primacy effect, which is where people are more likely to recall items at the beginning of a memorized list, just the beginning. And then you also have the recency effect, which says that people are more likely to recall items at the end of a memorized list. Okay, so there you go. That's the first term. Let's dive into the top 100, starting with closure, a Gestalt psychology term. As you all stars will probably remember, Gestalt psychology says that we tend to see organized patterns or the whole rather than bits and pieces that make up those patterns. So according to the APA, closure can be defined as when people tend to perceive incomplete forms as complete. In other words, our brains tend to fill in the missing parts so as to perceive the stimulus as the whole. So right here, you're looking at um, most of you are probably perceiving a triangle when in reality that triangle does not exist. Our brains are filling the gap there um, due to the process of closure. Um, all that really exists in this picture are these three weird Pac-Man shapes. However, our brain fills in the gaps there with closure. Here's another example of closure. Um, we have these pentagon shapes but most of us are probably going to see a soccer ball because our brains are filling in the gap. So there is term 100. And moving on to term 99, we have proximity, another Gestalt psychology term. And proximity occurs when elements are placed close together. And as a result, we tend to perceive them as part of a group. So as you can see over here, the image on the left, these squares have no proximity, but the squares on the right do. Okay, that's proximity. Here's another example of proximity. Instead of seeing six individual lines, we tend to see three pairs of two columns due to the closeness of each of those pairs. So that's proximity. That's another Gestalt psychology term. 
Now, by the way, there are more Gestalt psychology terms out there, but we don't have time to go over them all. They're not part of the top 100 list. I recommend that you check them out on your own. At number 98, we have the figure ground, okay? So the figure in an image is the focal point of the image. So in this case, the figure is going to be the tree. That is the figure, that is the focal point of this image. And then we have the ground, which is the background. So not only is the ground just the ground here, but it's also the sky and everything else that isn't the focal point, and everything else that isn't the tree. So the ground is everything that's not the focal point. Now, sometimes the figure and ground can become ambiguous. And we have a classic illusion here. This is the face and vase, vase illusion. And it depends on what you are focusing on. It depends on what the focal point is for you to know what the figure or ground is. So if you're looking at the black vase here in the middle, that becomes the figure while everything surrounding it becomes the ground. Or if you're looking at the faces looking at each other, okay, those faces become the figure or the focal point while the vase becomes the ground. At number 97, we have the reciprocity norm, which is a social standard that says if someone helps out another person, that individual is expected to return the favor. Okay, so for example, if you help someone move, you probably expect in the future to return the favor and you want them to help you move in the future. That's the reciprocity norm. Next up, we have group polarization, which says it is after discussing a topic, the group's group members' beliefs become more extreme than prior to the discussion. Okay, so an example of this might be a political party meeting. People, members of that political party, they go into the meeting with already held beliefs and then their views get more extreme after discussing those beliefs. Another example of group polarization might be like an extremist group meeting, such as the one that existed in Germany back in the 1930s. I don't want to say their name due to YouTube standards, um, but if they go into a meeting and they discuss their topics and uh, as they discuss those topics, their viewpoints get more extreme, that's group polarization. Now, group polarization doesn't necessarily need to be like a, a bad thing. Group polarization is great for self-help groups. Um, like Alcoholics Anonymous, okay? These individuals, they go in with these preconceived notions, these, these already, I shouldn't say preconceived, these already held beliefs, and as they discuss them, their beliefs become more extreme, and that's great for like self-help groups, okay? Now, please note, this term is not saying that a person is introduced to brand a brand new topic, and then after being introduced to a brand new topic, they begin to accept these new ideas. It's not saying that. The term is saying that a person already holds onto some set of beliefs, and as a result of discussing those beliefs, their beliefs become more extreme. Okay, at number 95 and number 94, we have confirmation bias and belief perseverance. As it says here, confirmation bias is the tendency for a person to look for information that supports their beliefs while ignoring or dismissing evidence that does not support their position. So, for example, let's say there's an election coming up and in this election you like a candidate and so what you're going to do is you're going to start to look for information uh, that supports your political candidate looking good. Okay, you're going to only look at information or data that says, hey, your political candidate's awesome. While at the same time, you're going to ignore other information that makes them look bad. That's confirmation bias. Now, confirmation bias is a little different than belief perseverance. Belief perseverance is the tendency for individuals to hold on to a belief even after being presented with information that discredits that belief. So a great example of this is flat earthers. There's a lot of data and a lot of, lot of evidence out there that discredits and disproves flat earthers, yet they go on holding onto their beliefs. In fact, there are some like YouTube clips and social media clips out there where flat earthers will do an experiment to try to prove that the earth is flat. They do the experiment and the experiment goes wrong, thus supporting that the earth is actually round, yet they still hold onto their beliefs. And it's kind of funny to see how sad they get when their you know experiment goes haywire and they're disproven. So what's the difference? What's the difference between these two terms? They're very similar. Well, with confirmation bias, one is actively seeking out evidence. They're going out and seeking out evidence to support their position. And with belief perseverance, 
This person isn't necessarily actively seeking out evidence to support their position. They're just ignoring any information that goes against their beliefs. Now, what I want you to do is take a look at this cartoon and tell me, does this cartoon, is this an example of belief perseverance or is this an example of confirmation bias? Go ahead and throw that in the chat real quick. Is this belief perseverance or confirmation bias? Go ahead and throw that in the chat. Yes, it is definitely confirmation bias. Why? Because the person is actively going out and seeking information that supports their position. Great job. Okay, so next up we have another social psych term, the self-serving bias, which is the tendency to overstate one's role when there's a positive outcome and understate it when there's a negative outcome. So for example, let's say that a student gets a good grade on a test and they attribute that good grade to them being smart. Hey, I'm smart, I study hard, that's why I got the good grade, okay? When there's a positive outcome, they're overstating their role. Then that same student goes to another class and they fail a test that day and they go, oh, the reason I failed the test was because the teacher's horrible, the test was too hard. I didn't have time to study. Okay, now they're understating their role because it's a negative outcome. That's an example of the self-serving bias. People who tend to do this a lot are politicians. Whenever something goes right, politicians are always like, hey, look at this bill that I put out or look at this idea that um, you know I put out that helped people, I did a great job. And then when something goes wrong, politicians quickly dodge questions and then place the blame on everybody else, even when it may actually be their fault. So that's the self-serving bias. Okay. At number 92, we have the stereotype threat, which is the anxiety that members of a group feel if they believe their performance will conform to a negative stereotype. So one of the classic experiments that dealt with the stereotype threat, um, dealt with a researcher um, who went out and did some studies with the STEM field. So real quick, let me back up for a second. Historically speaking, STEM field, science, technology, engineering, and math have been dominated by men. And as a result, there have been a lot of stereotypes that men do better than women in these fields. So one researcher went out and investigated this, and he went to a professor and said, hey, look, here's a test. When you give this test, before the test, this is what I want you to say. Before the test, I want you to say that men usually score better than women on this test. Well, what do you think happened? Throw it in the chat. What do you think happened when the professor said men score better than women on this test? Yes, that's right. Women perform worse, the men scored better, that's correct. So later on, the researcher gave the test to a similar group of students, but this time around, the professor did not make any statement or announcement prior to the test. Well, this time around, when no statement was made, what were the results? Well, when nothing was said, women actually did slightly better on average than the men because the stereotype threat was not present. So that is an example of the stereotype threat. Moving on to another social psych set of terms, and the first term on here is the foot in the door phenomenon, and this is a type of persuasion. So what happens with a foot in the door phenomenon is a person makes an initial request to another individual. And then after that individual agrees to the initial request, a larger request is then made to that individual. And then because the individual initially agreed to the first request, they are, as it says here at number four, they are more likely to accept the larger request after accepting the smaller one. That is the foot in the door phenomenon. So for example, let's say that someone comes up to you and says, hey, can I talk to you for a minute about X cause? And then you agree, you say, hey, sure. And then after they talk to you for a few minutes, they may go, hey, will you be willing to donate $25 to this cause? You or the person they're asking would be more likely to say yes after agreeing to the initial smaller request. And that's just part of you know human nature and it explains what the foot in the door phenomenon actually is. And the foot in the door phenomenon is kind of the opposite of what is known as the door in the face 
type of persuasion. And this is where initially a large request is made. And as it says here, the individual denies that large request. And then after the individual denies that request, a smaller request is made. And because the individual initially denied the larger request, they are more likely to accept the smaller request. So for example, you say, hey, mom, can I have 50 bucks to go hang out with my friends? Your mom says, no, she denies your re request. And then you say, hey, mom, what about 20? She's going to be more likely to say, yes, that is the door in the face effect. Now, something that I need to point out, it's very, very important for both of these terms to mention point two. All right, so with a foot in the door phenomenon that the individual agrees to the initial request and because they agree, they're more likely to accept the larger request. And then for number two, with the door in the face, they have to deny it and then a smaller request is made. And because they deny the initial request, then they are more likely to accept the smaller one. So make sure you have all of these parts. This is pretty much a summary word for word from a college board FRQ scoring guideline. At number 89, we have the types of aggression. The first type of aggression is hostile aggression where the end goal is physical harm. An example of hostile aggression would typically be a bar fight where one guy just wants to beat the snot out of another guy. That's hostile aggression. Another example of hostile aggression would be like if a guy got cheated on, so he goes and beats up the person who cheated with his wife. Okay, the end goal is harm. And that's a little different than instrumental aggression which is where aggression is used to achieve some other means. So for example, beating up or robbing someone to steal their wallet. The purpose is not to, you know, the initial purpose is not just to beat them up, but the end goal is to steal the wallet. Or the classic example is like the hired assassin. Okay. Their end goal is payment. Okay. So instrumental aggression is used to achieve some other means. At number 88, we have afferent and efferent sensory and motor neurons. Now, the first thing you need to know, and you probably know this because your teachers are all stars. The first thing you need to know about this term is that neurons are messengers that send signals throughout the body. So with sensory neurons, okay, sensory neurons are going to send uh, uh, signals from your senses, touch, taste, smell, etc., from your senses to your spinal cord and brain. Okay, sensory neurons, and as you can see here, um, sensory neurons send information at the brain. So think sensory at afferent, afferent at the brain. That's a little mnemonic device versus motor neurons, which send information from the brain to the rest of the body. So the most simplified way to think of what motor neurons do is motor neurons control movement. So when I'm moving my hands, that's the result of motor neurons uh, being sent signals from the brain to my hands, or if I'm running, motor neurons. So motor neurons, movement, uh, motor neurons also control your heart, digestion, breathing, etc. So motor neurons control movement, and they're also known as efferent or exiting neurons because they exit the brain. Next up, number 87, we have long-term potentiation, which is a process by which synaptic connections between neurons become stronger with frequent activation. So the thing that you need to understand about this term is that when we form a new memory or learn a new skill, neurons are making new connections or forming new pathways in the brain. So when we go to recall that memory or perform that task or skill in the future, what's happening is that we are activating or firing that same exact pathway that did not exist prior to learning that new skill, task, or memory. So when we learn something new for the first time, those new connections between neurons along the pathway are going to be super, super weak. And if you don't practice that information, those connections will physically break apart. And biologically speaking, that is what forgetting is, the breaking apart of neural pathways. So to keep those neural connections from breaking apart, you need to rehearse or practice the information over and over and over again to make sure those connections are stronger and stronger and stronger. And as a result, you'll be less likely to forget that information. So let's say, for example, you learn a new term in science class. When you start out learning a new term, those connections are going to be very weak but you go home and you practice your flashcards and practice and rehearse that term over and over and over, those synaptic connections will become stronger and stronger and stronger the more that they fire together. And that's exactly what long-term potentiation is. Now, 
Real quick, you probably know this already. Please note, neurons don't technically touch each other, even though we say that they're connected. However, there is a like glue that makes the bonds between neurons stronger the more often that they fire together. Now we have a bonus term and that is arousal. And the reason we're going over this is because we're gonna be talking about arousal and applying to a bunch of other terms tonight. So arousal is a state of alertness and or being awake. And so let's say that you hear a loud bang or you hear a twig snap in the woods behind you in the dark and you're alone, okay? You're gonna feel aroused or alert and your body's gonna go, hey, is this a threat? Do I need to run? Do I need to fight? In other words, being aroused or alert prepares you to react to stimulus or stimuli in the environment. And some physiological indicators of arousal kick in when your nervous, or excuse me, when your sympathetic nervous system kicks in. So for example, when one is aroused, they're going to have an increased heart rate. They're going to have higher blood pressure, increased perspiration, rapid breathing, pupil dilation, and more. And another part of the body within the brain that controls arousal is the reticular formation. And as you can see here, the reticular formation is a network of nerves that runs up and down the um, brainstem and it controls arousal and focus. So for example, if this was severed, if somehow a doctor was able to go in and just sever the reticular formation, you would fall into a coma that you would never be able to wake up from. At the same time, um, if you were in a deep sleep and a doctor was able to probe it and stimulate your reticular formation, you would jump wide awake. So that is arousal and some other kind of bonus terms to go along with that. Now, real quick, we're gonna be talking about arousal, the sympathetic nervous system a lot during this video. So I wanna do a quick refresher on the nervous system. So here's a quick video for you. Psychology scholars, today we're going to go over the different parts of the nervous system. The first thing we're going to look at is the difference between the central and peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is made up of the brain and spinal cord, the brain being the control center of the body, and the spinal cord being the information highway that sends messages to and from the brain and to and from the rest of the body. Next up, we have the peripheral nervous system, which is made up of nerves that branch off of the brain and spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system is divided into two parts called the somatic and autonomic nervous system. The somatic nervous system controls voluntary movement movement via the use of our skeletal muscles. In addition to motor nerves, it contains sensory nerves as well. For example, if you hit your finger with a hammer, that's going to be detected by the somatic nervous system and sent to your brain for processing. Next up, we have the autonomic nervous system, which controls our digestive, respiratory, circulatory, and reproductive functions. The autonomic nervous system is split into two parts, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is our body's alert system that responds to stressors, which includes anything from running away from a guy with a chainsaw to the physiological arousal that takes place while you're playing a sport or taking a test. When the sympathetic nervous system is active, our heart rate accelerates, noradrenaline is released for the fight or flight response, digestion slows down to conserve energy, our pupils dilate, and more. On the other hand, the parasympathetic nervous system does the opposite. It calms the body down after a stressful situation. For example, the heart rate slows down, digestion picks back up, the pupils constrict, and more. So the question remains, when this guy yeeted his golf club into the stratosphere, did the sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system kick in the second the club left his hands? Catch you later, All-Stars. And the answer to that question would be the sympathetic nervous system that kicks in in arousing situations. So that brings us to number 86, the arousal theory of motivation. And this says that people are motivated to engage in a given behavior to raise or lower their arousal. So, for example, uh, if someone wants to raise their arousal level, what's something that they could do? Throw that in the chat. What's something that someone could do to raise, to raise their arousal level? Throw in the chat real quick, All-Stars. What is something people could do to raise their arousal level? What do you got? What activities or actions? Roller coaster, go for a run. Yeah, what else? Great job, Angel and Sabrina. Exercise, go for a run. Good. Okay, and then maybe something that could lower their arousal level would be like relaxation techniques or just sitting on the couch and watching TV. 
um, that isn't a scary movie. So yeah, to raise one's arousal level, as Socrates says, horror movie, scary movie, great. Okay, now, when you see the arousal theory of motivation, it could also relate to the Yerkes Dotson law, which is actually our number 27 overall term. And you can find that in the next video, which goes over the top 50 AP psych terms, but we're not going to dive into it in detail. Um, but basically, real quickly, the Yerkes Dotson law says that people perform their best at a moderate level of arousal. Now, there's way more to that, but arousal theory could also be referring to Yerkes Dotson. So just a heads up on that. Okay. At number 85, we have the different theories of emotion. These come up all the time. You have to know them. There's a lot of them. So let's go through this real quick. The first theory is the common sense theory, which says there's a stimulus. And the stimulus we're just going to use for this example over and over is a twig snapping in the woods. You're walking alone at night. Okay. And that's the stimulus. So according to the common sense theory, uh, after the stimulus, the emotion kicks in, you start to feel afraid. And because you feel afraid, that leads to the arousal kicking in. That leads to your heart racing, your pupil dilating, your pupils dilating, sweaty palms, um, your breathing uh, going faster, okay? Emotion leads to the arousal. That is the common sense theory. Then you have the James Lang theory, which switches the arousal and the emotion. So you have the stimulus, you have the twigs snapping in the woods, then your heart beats faster, your palms get sweaty, your pupils dilate. And then as a result of the arousal, the James Lang theory says this leads to the emotion of fear. And by the way, this is the same James as in William James you learned in probably the first or second unit of your AP psychology course. And then next up, we have the Cannon Bard theory, which says when the stimulus goes off, Again, the twig snapping, it will lead to simultaneously the emotion and the arousal kick in at the same exact time. That's the Cannon Bard theory. And then next up, a very interesting theory is the Schachter Singer two factor theory, which says, hey, you have a stimulus. Again, the twig snapping, the stimulus causes your heart to beat fast, your uh, pumps to sweat, your pupils to dilate. And then you have something down here called cognitive appraisal. And cognitive appraisal says, hey, Look, I noticed that my heart's beating faster and my breathing's picked up, but why? Why? Well, I need to appraise or evaluate the stimulus. Oh, there was that twig snapping behind me in the woods in the dark. And because I'm evaluating the stimulus, this will lead to the emotion. And in this case, it's fear. Now, let's change up the stimulus real quick instead of having a twig snap. Okay, let's say the stimulus is a roller coaster. Okay, the roller coaster, just like last time, is going to make your heart beat faster. It's going to make your pupils dilate and do all those things related to arousal. It's going to do all the same exact physiological things as the last slide. But because of the cognitive appraisal, you have to go, okay, why are all of these systems kicking in? Oh, it's because I'm on a roller coaster. And assuming you love roller coasters like I do, that's going to lead to a different emotion. And in this case, it's going to lead to joy. So that is the Schachter Singer two-factor theory of emotion. And then you have other guys named Zions and Ladeau, and they argue that cognition does not always precede an emotional response. Cognition does not always precede an emotional response. So let's say that you're looking at something in the environment. I know it's beneath my image here, but let's say you're looking at something scary like a spider or a snake or anything that's scary. That information is going to be sent to the thalamus. And remember, the thalamus is the air traffic control center of the brain and it's going to reroute it directly to the amygdala. And the amygdala is the part of the brain that is the first responder to stress. And it also deals with like extreme emotions like anger, fear, rage, stuff like that. Okay. So again, Zions and Ladeau argue that cognition does not always precede an emotional response. It just happens automatically. And by the way, bonus question here, what sense does the thalamus not reroute to the correct location of the brain? Which of the five senses does the thalamus not reroute to the correct location of the brain? This sense does not go through the thalamus. Throw that in the chat real quick. What do you got? What do you got? What do you got? Just waiting on the chat to catch up. Smell. Yes. Good job, Anya. Good job, Joseph. Hrithika. Great job, guys. Okay. Now, We talked about how Zion Slendo say, hey, 
Cognition does not always precede an emotional response. Well, Schachter and Singer and Richard Lazarus would say, well, there are times that you have to think about what you're seeing in the environment. So according to Schachter and Singer, if you see a spider, a snake, whatever it may be, that information is going to be routed to the thalamus. And then instead of going directly to the amygdala, it's going to go from the thalamus to the visual cortex. And it's going to work in conjunction with other parts of your brain, like the frontal lobe. And after your brain processes and goes, hey, that's a scary stimulus, it's eventually going to be sent to the amygdala. So Schachter and Singer and Richard Lazarus say, hey, nope, there isn't this like fast route. There's a more slow way of processing the information in the environment, which will eventually cause an emotional response. And lastly, for the theories of emotion, we do have Lazarus's cognitive appraisal theory. It's very similar to the cannon bar theory. It says, hey, you got a stimulus up front. And what your brain's going to do is it's going to evaluate. It's going to appraise the stimulus. Oh, that's kind of scary. And as a result of appraising the stimulus, it's going to lead to the emotional response and the arousal happening at the same exact time. So this is like cannon and bard, except with the cognitive appraisal aspect right in the middle of it. At number 84, we have the cerebellum. Now, you need to know every single part of the brain, inside and out. Okay, but we're going to highlight the cerebellum here. The cerebellum is attached to the brain stem, and it sits below the cerebrum with all these different lobes. Now, the main functions of the cerebellum deal with coordination, motor control, balance. And in fact, in regards to balance, it works in uh, conjunction with the vestibular system, those semicircular canals to keep you upright and keep you, you know, balanced. Now, one thing to know about the cerebellum is that it deals with the fine tuning of movement. In other words, if the cerebellum is damaged, you'll be able to move your hands and feet around, but you wouldn't be able to have the coordination to like play the guitar or type on the keyboard. Okay. Because the fine tuning of movement has been destroyed to like whatever damaged the cerebellum. Um, if the cerebellum was damaged, you also wouldn't be able to like dance because you couldn't maintain your balance. Something else that's important to note about the cerebellum is that slurred speech and stumbling happen do happen here when alcohol affects this region of the brain. So I'll say that again, slurred speech and stumbling happen here if alcohol, if someone's, you know, drinking too much. Um, that's affecting the cerebellum. And the last very important thing that you need to know about the cerebellum is that it plays a role in muscle memory or procedural memory. Procedural memory is a type of implicit memory that does not require conscious recall. And what procedural or muscle memory is, is memories of skills that are built up through repetition over and over and over. So a classic example of procedural memory is shooting a foul shot. You take those foul shots and shoot them over and over and over until you really don't have to think about it. It's just, you know, muscle memory. Riding a bike is another example of a procedural memory. Okay, so these are types of procedural memories that are processed by the cerebellum. So here is the next question for you, chat. Here's the next question. Which side of the brain, according to College Board, because it's a little more complicated than this, but according to College Board and the AP psych test that you're going to take, which side of the brain processes language? What do we got? Which side of the brain processes language? The hemisphere of the brain, according to College Board, we're, we're oversimplifying things, that processes language is the left side of the brain. Please, please, please note that it's the left side or the left hemisphere of the brain. Now, technically speaking, it's a little more complex than that. But for College Board purposes, the left side of the brain processes language. In reality, language processing can be found in the left hemisphere for about 90% of right-handed people, okay, and 70% of left-handed people. So it's a little more complicated than that, but for college board purposes, it's the left side. Okay, so let's talk about language in the brain. There are three major areas that you need to know in regards to the processing of language. The first area is the Broca's area which is in the, um, the prefrontal cortex of the frontal lobe, the Broca's area produces speech. I'll say that again. The Broca's area produces speech. Okay, so the way I like to remember this, and it's ridiculous, it's silly, and remember, the more wild um, and wacky your mnemonic device is, the more likely you're, you are to remember the thing on the test. 
But the way I remember the Brokers area is how um, lacrosse guys go around going, bro, what's up, bro, 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 bro. Okay, they need their Brokers area to make that sound, to make the word bro. Okay, so the Brokers area produces speech. And damage to this area, whether due to like a disease, trauma, or a stroke, leads to expressive aphasia, where one is not able to speak. Um, and ex expressive aphasia can be, you know, a complete loss of speech or a partial loss of speech. It just depends. Next up, we have Wernicke's area on the temporal lobe here. Remember, the temporal lobe processes is incoming sound. And we have Wernicke's area, which interprets spoken language. Wernicke's area interprets spoken language. Okay, so you would not be able to understand what I'm saying without your Wernicke's area right now. And damage to this region would lead to receptive aphasia, which is the loss of the ability to comprehend spoken language and also written language. And then lastly, on the parietal lobe here, we have the angular gyrus, which takes visual stimuli, like the letters or words on the page or the words on the screen that you're reading right now. It takes visual stimuli and turns it into auditory information, which then Wernicke's area uses to understand what is written. Okay, so it looks at the, the images and it sends it over to Wernicke's area and Wernicke's area is able to understand what is written. So what this means is this, damage to the angular gyrus leaves a person able to speak and understand, understand what, spoken language, but unable to read and write. So that is the angular gyrus. At number 82, we have inattentional blindness, and this goes hand in hand with selective attention. Well, selective attention is focusing on one thing while ignoring everything else, and we can define inattentional blindness as failing to notice a recognizable stimulus because one's attention is focused elsewhere. Now, there are a couple examples out there of a classic experiment where the video starts off with, count the number of passes the team in white makes. And I know this image isn't the best, but the team in white and the team in black both have a basketball. And so you're supposed to count how many passes the team in white makes. And I forget exactly how many passes they make, but you're busy focusing on how many passes they make. And let's say they make like 13 passes. And you're like, oh yeah, they made 13 passes. Well, this is going on at full speed. And the video is like, hey, congratulations if you got 13 passes. And then it said, yeah, they got 13 passes, but did you see the moonwalking bear come through the screen in the middle? And the majority of people who watch this do not see the moonwalking bear due to inattentional blindness. Okay, they're selectively attending to the passes being made, and this bear comes through, does a little dance, and you miss it. So I've actually linked the original video, not this one, in the description below. Highly recommend showing it to your friends and family, but since you already know what's going to happen, it's probably not going to trick you, but it's a great um, fun thing to show friends and family. So that's an example of inattentional blindness. And number 81, we have the cocktail party effect. And this says it's a person's ability to focus on one stimulus while ignoring all others. And it's a type of selective attention. So for example, let's say you're at a school dance and there's a lot of noise and a lot of stuff going on around you even though there's all this noise and stuff going on around you, you're still able to focus on and hear and understand the person right next to you due to your selective attention and the cocktail party effect. Another example of this would be like if you're in a loud setting, like a sports game or you're at a restaurant or wherever and you hear your name, someone say your name from across the room, you're able to selectively attend to that person saying your name um, even though there is so much other stimuli going on in the environment, the cocktail party effect. And number 80, we have cognitive maps. This is Tolman's cognitive maps. Remember, Tolman did the whole rats thing. So cognitive maps are a mental representation of the layout of one's environment. So go ahead and close your eyes for a second. Can you picture how to get to your friend's house step-by-step step without using a GPS or map? If you can do so, that's an example of a cognitive map. Or can you picture how to navigate around your school going from first period to your last period of the day? If you can picture how to navigate the building, then that's an example of a cognitive map. So 
that one's pretty straightforward. At number 79, we have Kurt Lewin's types of conflict. The first type of conflict is the approach-approach conflict where one has a choice between two desirable outcomes. So an example of this might be, uh, might be choosing between two good colleges. Another example of this might be, hey, you get to choose between going to a movie with your friends and you really want to see this movie, or you have to, or you get to choose between going on a date with that person from your site class. Okay, you got two good options there, and then you have to make a choice between those two good options. And then you also have the avoidance, avoidance conflict, which is a choice between two options that have unattractive outcomes. So maybe your parents say, hey, you can either clean the bathroom or mow the lawn. You have two unattractive outcomes. You also have the approach avoidance, which is when one event or goal has attractive and unattractive features. So let's say someone wants ice cream, but at the same time, they are also lactose intolerant. That's an example of the approach avoidance conflict. And then lastly, we have the multiple approach avoidance conflict where you have to choose between two or more options and each option has both des desirable and undesirable features. So for example, option one, make sure you guys can see this. Okay, option one, you're gonna go on vacation and there's an amazing location, it's beautiful. However, it's super, super, super expensive. Versus option two, option two, is a solid location. It's not as good as option one, but it's a lot cheaper. So again, the multiple approach avoidance conflict is the choice between two or more options that both have desirable and undesirable features. Next up, we have habituation, which is the diminished effectiveness of a stimulus in eliciting a response or bringing about a response following repeated exposure to the stimulus. Um, a good example of this would be like, let's say your parents buy a house near an airport. And at first, all you can pay attention to is the loud and noisy planes going by. But over time, even though those planes are still loud and noisy, um, you get used to them and you ignore them due to the habituation process. Another example of habituation would be like, hey, you're playing peekaboo with a little kid. You're playing peekaboo. And at first they love it, but over time they're just like, okay, I've seen it all. I'm done with peekaboo. Let me pay attention or focus on something else. Again, the diminished effectiveness of a stimulus and bringing about a response follow repeated exposure to that stimulus. Okay, here's my next question. And you can throw your answer into the chat. If someone gave you this briefcase and said, there's a million dollars inside, if you can get the right combination, how could you be sure to guarantee yourself that you would get the right combination? Go ahead and throw your answers in the chat. How can you guarantee yourself to get the right combination? What do you got, guys? What do you got, All-Stars? How can you be sure to get the right combination? That's right, that's right. Try every combination or an algorithm. Great job, all stars. So yes, you could try every combination starting at 000, then go to 001, 002, 003. And this is an example of an algorithm, which is a step-by-step -step procedure that guarantees solving a problem. However, the downside to an algorithm is that it is slow, okay? It is slow. It can take a very long time to potentially get that right answer. Now it could be quick, but typically it's slow. So know that term that showed up a lot in recent years. At number 76, we have framing, which is presenting a problem, question, or situation in a way that impacts how the issue is perceived. So let me give you two scenarios. A doctor comes up to me and says, hey, there's a 10% chance you will die during the surgery versus, hey, Mr. Ireland, there's a 90% chance you will survive this surgery. That's an example of framing, all right? They both mean the same thing, but the way it's worded or framed is totally different, okay? So that's framing. Real quick, guys, we are pretty much halfway there. Um, if this has helped you so far, please consider subscribing to the channel 
And also, if you could give that like button a smash, that would be awesome. Here we go. Number 75, source amnesia or source misattribution is incorrectly identifying where a memory came from. So as I was saying, there's an election coming up. You tell your friend about something that a candidate allegedly said or did, and they go, hey, where'd you hear that? And you go, oh, I don't know, maybe YouTube or a news article or something. That's source amnesia. Or maybe you go up to a friend and say, hey, did you hear about that really epic thing that happened the other day? And you say, yeah, I heard about it because I'm the one who told you that last week. That's source misattribution. Okay, so tomato, tomato with these terms. Okay, real quick, I want you to look at these letters and take 10 seconds to memorize as many of these letters as possible. Okay, 10 seconds to memorize as many letters as possible starting now. Couple more seconds. All right. Can you recall the letters? Go ahead and throw as many letters as you can in the chat. All right. Some of you guys did a great job. Awesome. All right. So I have a second row here. Go ahead and take a couple seconds to memorize row two, which contain actually the same exact letters. Row two contains the same exact letters. Can you guys recall the letters from the second row? I would hope so. I would really hope so. So again, row one and row two contain the same exact letters. Okay. But why was row two easier to memorize? And that's because the letters were organized or chunked into more meaningful units. So that's what term 74 is. The term is chunking, organizing information into meaningful units to be stored in memory. And when you chunk information, it helps you memorize things way, way more efficiently. So here's another example of chunking. Okay, here's a grocery list. Your parents say memorize it and for whatever reason you can't put it in your phone and you can't write it down. Okay, so this is an unchunked list. You're more likely to memorize and recall it later if you chunk this list by the type of meal you're trying to make. Another example of chunking would be an acronym, which is a word that's created by combining typically the first letters of a phrase together. These are examples of chunking. What is Roy G. Biv and what does PEMDAS stand for? Roy G. Biv and PEMDAS, what do those stand for? Colors, yes. Colors of what? Sadhana's got the correct colors down. It's the colors of the rainbow. There you go. And then PEMDAS is your order of operations for math. You got your parentheses, your exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. And those are examples of chunking. At number 73, we have functional fixedness, which is a cognitive bias that limits a person's ability to use an object in a way other than its intended purpose. So as a result, a person be can become stuck or fixated with um, their inability to think of an alternate use for that object. So for example, can anybody think of an alternate use for a quarter? Its primary use is to pay for things. That's its intended function. Okay, but can anybody in the chat think of another use for a quarter? What do we got, chat? What are some other uses for a quarter? Scratch card. Good, Charlotte. What else? Coin flip. Unlocking doors. Haven't heard of that one, but I'll take your word for it, Shree. Gum. <laughs> um, not falling on that one, Sabrina. Yep. Great job, guys. So you have overcome functional fixedness. If you thought that the only use for a quarter was using it to pay for something, you would be stuck or fixated. By, But by thinking of alternative uses for a quarter, you have overcome functional fixedness. So great job there. All right, here's an example of someone else overcoming functional fixedness. They're using their coffee pot for something other than its primary intended purpose. And in this case, it's to cook hot dogs. And by the way, 
Boiled hot dogs are the worst. If you're going to cook hot dogs, please, 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 um, if you have the ability, put them on a pan or, or the grill. Okay, boiled hot dogs are the worst. But that is overcoming functional fix-itness right there. At number 72, we have a mental set, which is when an individual uses a solution that worked in the past on a current... I know, why? Sorry, these... This, this chat's catching up. Yeah, why? Uh, so again, mental a mental set is when an individual uses a solution that worked in the past on a current problem, which may or may not help solve the current problem. So for example, the last time your computer froze, you restarted it and it worked. So this time your computer freezes, it freezes you're going to restart it hoping that it will work again. Okay. Um, or the classic I like to point to is like a little kid trying to pull one of these doors. Okay, you don't know really which way uh, this door is going to open because they have the handlebars on both sides. Okay, so last time they tried the door, they pulled and it opened so that when they go up to the door this time, they're going to try pulling uh, this time and they're not going to be able to open it from the opposite side. Um, that would be an example of a mental set. And number 71, we have reciprocal determinism. This is Bandora's reciprocal determinism. I would say Bandora is probably one of, if not the most popular psychologist researcher to show up on the AP psych test. So know everything about Bandora. And reciprocal determinism is the belief that one's thoughts, behavior, and environment all influence one another. So let's say there's an individual, um, we'll call them Sally. Okay. Sally has some personal factors. Her belief, her cognition, her thought about herself is that she is a good student. And because she's a, she thinks she's a good student, she studies hard. That's her behavior, studying, studying hard. And because she studies hard, it leads her to get good grades. And when she gets good grades, she gets praise from her teachers and family. And because she gets praise from her teachers and family, she believes herself to be a good student. And at the same time, that reinforces her notion that she should continue to study harder. So again, reciprocal determinism is the belief that one's thoughts, behavior, and the environment all influence one another. Now, on the AP Psych test, make sure you identify all three parts or all three aspects of reciprocal determinism. Otherwise, you may not score. All right, up next, at number 70, we have Julian Rotter's personal control. And the first thing we're going to talk about is an external locus of control, which is one's perception that chance or outside forces control their fate versus an internal locus of control or the perception that an individual can control their own fate. Okay, so if someone says, or if someone were to say, no matter what I do, no matter how hard I study, no matter what I do, I cannot impact my AP psych test score, that would be an external locus of control. That person would believe that nothing they could do, there's nothing they could do to um, have a positive impact on that situation. Okay, versus someone who says, you know, if I study hard, I can do well on the AP psych test, even though it may be difficult. That's an internal, internal locus of control. And who achieves more in general? The person who has an internal locus of control achieves more so than the person with an external locus of control who believes that outside forces control, you know, fate and everything about their life. And that brings us to the learned helplessness experiment. And this was a very interesting experiment by Martin Seligman. So this is a two-part experiment where you have in part one, three groups of dogs who are, who are all harnessed up. Group one was harnessed up, but they were not shocked. That was the control group. Group two was harnessed up. They were shocked. However, there was a lever that the dogs could hit to stop the shock. And then lastly, there was group three who was shocked and the lever was present, but when they hit the lever, nothing happened. And so they were, they continued to be shot. And then these dogs from each of these groups were taken and put into part two of the experiment. They were put into this little contraption right here. Now, group one, they were put in this contraption. And, and as you can see on this side of the floor, the dogs were shocked. However, they could escape to the other side of the floor where they would not be shocked. Well, group one, the control group, they, once they were shocked, they jumped to the other side to safety. Group two, 
who was shocked, but when they hit the lever, the shock stopped. They also jumped to the other side to safety. However, group three, who had learned previously that, hey, no matter what I do, I cannot stop the shock. Instead of jumping to the other side to safety, group three just stood there and accepted the shock. Okay, even though there was a way out. There was a way out, but they accepted the shock. And this is very similar to an external locus of control, the belief that no matter what I do, I cannot control the outcome of my situation. And the way we define learned helplessness is as follows. When one feels as if they are unable to change the outcome of their situation after repeated aversive events. And this leads to a pessimistic outlook. And a pessimistic person or someone who maintains a pessimistic explanatory style expects bad things to happen. They believe that things are beyond their control versus an optimist or someone with an optimistic explanatory style. An optimist believes or tends to see the good in things even in bad situations. Um, and optimists also tend to believe that problems are temporary and not their own fault. So examples of learned helplessness, you have the dog experiment, or you could just think of a student who is struggling in school. You know, if a student fails a couple of tests, they may give up. They may go, why try? There's nothing I can do to impact the outcome of this situation. And related to this is positive psychology. So this is Martin Seligman. He was the creator of positive psychology. And let me just move this real quick. And positive psychology, as it says here, focuses on the study of optimal human functioning and the factors that allow individuals to thrive. Uh, kind of ironic when you're shocking dogs there. Well, why is this important? Well, positive psychologists, kind of similar to cognitive psychologists, like to challenge individuals' beliefs. So for example, if a person experienced learned helplessness or if they have a pessimistic outlook because they failed a test, instead of getting that person to go, hey, I'm stupid, a positive psychologist would encourage an individual to argue with themselves or challenge their own beliefs by saying things like, I could have studied better and will do so next time. I should have asked the teacher for help and would do and will do so next time. That's what positive psychology is all about. And that brings us to humanistic psychology. And we have to talk a little bit about humanistic psychology and give some background to talk about the next couple of terms. Humanistic psychology is all about self-improvement and helping people become the best person they can be. The founder of humanistic psychology was Carl Rogers and another big guy by the name of Abraham Maslow, which brings us to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And the basic premise behind Maslow's hierarchy of needs is that we all kind of start at the bottom level here where our physiological needs are. And once most of the needs are met in one level, then we can hopefully move on up to the next level with the ultimate goal of being self-actualized or reaching self-actualization. Okay, so first off, psychological needs need to be met. So people need air, obviously, without it. You know where that goes. They need food and water. So once most of the needs are met here, then they can worry more about their safety needs. They can worry more about, you know, job security, employment, personal security, having property, okay, shelter and property, maybe not always the same. Someone who is homeless might have shelter, but not have like a house or an apartment to live in. Once safety needs are met, people are going to worry about building relationships and then esteem needs. Okay. And again, the ultimate goal is self-actualization. And the way College Board defines self-actualization is fulfilling one's highest potential, being fully accepting of oneself or becoming one's ideal self. So make sure you get that definition down. That's important because self-actualization comes up a lot. Now, there's a lot of criticisms of Maslow's hierarchy in that self-actualization is actually hard to define. Okay, you obviously have a definition here, but how do you measure or test self-actualization? And the other thing is self-actualization could look different from person to person. It could look different from me, uh, from me to you. It could look different. Okay, so that is a criticism of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And then also under the humanistic psychology umbrella, you have what is called the self-concept that Maslow and Rogers talked about. So the self-concept asks the question, how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself in a positive or negative light? So this person on the left has a lot more positive 
thoughts about themselves compared to the person on the right. So the person on the left has a positive self-concept and the person on the right has a negative self-concept. And in dealing with this concept of self-concept, um, Rogers talks about the difference between what is known as the ideal self, who we want to be, and the real self, who we actually are. So this person ideally wants to be an honest person. They want to be a hard worker. But in reality, they cheat on a test. They don't study. And as a result, this leads to incongruence. And an incongruence can lead to stress and anxiety. So the question becomes, how do we get rid of the incongruence so that we can have congruence? And when we have congruence, Rogers says we become fully functioning people, which was just kind of his word for self-actualization. So to get rid of this incongruence, Rogers said individuals needed to be treated with what is known as an unconditional positive regard, which is just where a person like a teacher, a therapist, or parent is fully accepting towards another individual, even if the bad behavior is not accepted. So for example, a humanistic therapist or a humanistic psychologist would show acceptance and compassion towards an alcoholic, but they would not accept their behavior. And for a parent, they can show their kid an unconditional positive regard by showing them that their behavior is what's bad and not the child themselves. So for example, let's say a parent has a kid, the kid takes a marker or pen and starts drawing all over the walls. And as a result, the parent comes up and says, hey, you're a bad boy. Well, that's not showing an unconditional positive regard. At this point, the kid may think, well, I like drawing on the wall. I must be bad. Or coloring on the wall is bad, and I'm bad if I like it. So now I don't like coloring as a result. So what the parent should say instead, according to Rogers, is that, hey, look, I love you, but I don't like it when you draw on the wall. And by doing this, the parent is affirming the kid but not the behavior. And by doing so, the parent is showing an unconditional positive regard, which is not going to cause incongruence for the child. So if we zoom in here, this person now has congruence because they've been treated with an unconditional positive regard where the ideal self and the real self line up more than before. Okay, now we have congruence, which leads to a higher mental well-being and a higher self-esteem. Please note that um, there's probably always going to be some type of incongruence, but you know, the more congruence, the better. So higher congruence leads to higher self-esteem and self-esteem can be defined as feelings of self-worth. So someone with a high self-esteem may say, Hey, what I do matters. I'm a good student. I look great in what I wear. I'm fun to be with. Okay. Those are traits of someone with a high self-esteem and someone with a low self-esteem may say the opposite. So people with a high self-esteem tend to be happier. They tend to be healthier. They're better able to cope with stress in general. Now, one thing that I want you to note is this. Don't confuse the term self-esteem with the term self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is the number 23 FRQ term overall. It's in the next video. And self-efficacy can be defined as one's confidence in their own ability to complete a task. So for example, if your coach looks at you and says, hey, I want you to take the last shot with the game on the line, your confidence in your ability to hit that shot would be your self-efficacy. Okay, if you think you're going to hit that shot, you're going to have a high self-efficacy versus if you think you're going to miss the shot. Same thing with your AP psych test. If you think you're going to get an A on the AP psych test, you're going to have a high self or a five, I should say. You're going to have a high self-efficacy. Now, as it says here, too much self-esteem can lead to narcissism, which is an inflated view of oneself that leads to attention-seeking and exploitative behavior. So just be aware of that and know this term because narcissism could show up on the test. Now, something that I want to run through real quickly because I think this is going to be a review for most of you is the measures of central tendency, which include the mean, median, and mode, and also the range. So as you probably know, the mean is the average in a data set, the median is the middle number, and the mode is the most common number. So on the AP psych test, whenever you get a data set, the first thing you want to do is unscramble the data so that the numbers are in ascending order. They're increasing. And we're going to use this data set for the next couple of examples. So when calculating the mean, what you need to do is you need to add up the sum of the numbers 
and divide it by the total number of values in the data set. So we're gonna add up one plus one plus three plus four plus six. And there are how many numbers in this data set? One, two, three, four, five. So adding up the numbers, dividing it by the total number in the data set, and we can simplify it to 15 divided by five, and therefore the mean or the average is three. And on the test, don't just write the number three, you're gonna to wanna to write out, hey, the, the mean is three in relation to whatever they're asking you to do on the FRQ. The median is the middle number, okay? So you find the middle number of the data set. In this case, it's real easy, it's three. Um, if you have an even, um, a, a data set with an even amount of um, numbers in it, then you take the two middle numbers and average them together. Lastly is the mode. The mode is the most common number or the most frequently occurring number. And in this case, it's obvious one occurs the most frequently. There you go. And then the range, which is the largest number minus the smallest number. So it's gonna be six minus one and the range is five. Boom, you guys got that. Okay, that brings us to number 63, standard deviation, which tells us how close the values in a data set are to the mean. So for example, right here we have two bell curves, two normal distributions or normal curves. And the red curve has a small deviation. In other words, the data are more squished up against the mean, while the blue curve has a large deviation. The data is way more spread out, okay? But the way the College Board wants you to say this is that the scores in blue, in the blue data set are more varied. Don't say squished or spread out, say varied. The scores in the blue data set are more varied than the scores in the red data set. So that is standard deviation. And if you get a question on the test that says something like, which of the following options has the greatest standard deviation? You could calculate it, but it would take you forever. Or you can use a shortcut and that shortcut or trick is to look at the range. So if you look at the range for all of these options, uh, option A, 24 minus 10, it's gonna be 14. The range for B is 25. The range for C is three, okay? The uh, And then it asks, which of the following options has the greatest standard deviation? In this case, since it's greatest, it's gonna be the one with the largest range and therefore B is the correct answer. So option B is gonna look more like this blue curve here than the rest of the, um, than the red curve. Another real quick example comes from the 2021 AP Psych FRQ set two. And it says, explain what the different standard deviations indicate about the data for the two groups. So group A has a standard deviation of four and group B has a standard deviation of six. Well, you can't just say, hey, group B standard deviation is larger. What you need to say is the following. The data in group B is more varied than the data in group A. That's what College Board wants you to say. And it looks like this. Group A has the smaller deviation. Group B has the larger deviation. And once again, the data in group B is more varied than the data in group A. And real quick, if you have any trouble with the stats portion of the AP Psych test, I have a video that simplifies all the stats stuff that you need to know. I put the link in the comments, or sorry, in the description below. At number 62, getting there guys, we have the circadian rhythm, which are biological cycles that occur about every 24 hours. Um, and these biological cycles deal with how awake or tired we are, or maybe we're completely asleep, and also body temperature. So for example, when we wake up in the morning, our body temperature st starts to rise a little bit. And when we go to sleep, our body temperature decreases, the circadian rhythm. And that brings us to number 61, REM sleep. Now we don't have time to go into all the stages of sleep. Um, we don't have time to go into all the little details about sleep disorders and all that stuff. We're gonna focus mainly on REM sleep. And as it says here, REM sleep stands for rapid eye movement sleep. So what happens during REM sleep is your eyes are closed and behind your closed eyelid, um, your eyeballs are moving around rapidly as such. That is REM sleep. Now, that's not what you need to say on your AP psych test. I just wanted to describe that to you. Okay, so REM sleep, what you need to know, let me move this out of the way real quick. REM sleep is where most dreams occur. Most dreams occur during REM sleep. That's really important. And one of the theories behind what the purpose of REM sleep is, is that our brains process and consolidate our experiences 
and memories from that day. That's one of the theories behind REM sleep. Another thing to know about REM sleep is that it is considered paradoxical sleep. In other words, your arm and leg muscles are very relaxed and therefore during REM sleep, your arm and leg muscles, you can't move them. But at the same time, your brain is very active and is producing the same type of brain waves as if you were wide awake. So during REM sleep, your body produces, um, your brain produces beta waves. And while you're wide awake, your brain also produces beta waves. So it's exactly the same. So this is considered paradoxical sleep. You can't move, but your brain is super, super, super active. Another thing that um, you need to know is that when you miss a lot of sleep, you enter REM rebound. And REM rebound is what happens if you miss a lot of sleep, you will tend to spend more time in the REM cycle than you normally would. And so that's it for REM, but don't forget about the other stuff that you need to know in regards to sleep and dreams. Okay, real quickly, let's talk about some correlation stuff, okay? Cor correlational studies show relationships. So right here, we have a positive correlation, a negative correlation, and no correlation. Um, and you should know, and this is the number 16 term overall, that correlation does not imply causation. If you see correlation on your AP psych test, this should be the first thing you write down. So here's an example. As ice cream sales increase and then decrease, so do violent crimes. Do ice cream sales cause the violent crimes? No. And this is why correlation does not imply causation. This has more to do with weather than anything else. Um, and you should also note that only experiments can prove cause and effect. That's really important. So if you see something about an experiment, you should write only experiments can prove cause and effect. And if you see something about correlations on the FRQ, write correlation does not imply causation. Which brings us to number 60, 10 more guys, the correlation coefficient um, or R values. A correlation, the correlation coefficient shows us a number, and usually with AP Psych, this will be a given number that shows us a strength of relationship between two things, like we looked at back on those graphs. So a R value or correlation coefficient of zero shows no correlation. A R value um, that is positive between zero and positive one shows you a positive increase in correlation. And then an R value between zero and negative one shows you a negative correlation. And what you need to know is that the further from zero, the stronger the relationship. So for example, here's one R value, R equals negative 0.86. Here's another R value, R equals positive 0.5. Okay, the further from zero, the stronger the relationship. So the R value of negative 0.86 is, has a stronger relationship than the R value of 0.5. Here's a quick practice problem for you. Which of the following has the strongest relationship? Go ahead and throw your answers in the chat as soon as you get a chance. Which has the strongest relationship? Go for it. Throw in the chat. A, B, C, D, or E. Which has the strongest relationship? What do you got, All-Stars? Okay, so I see answers popping up and this is a little bit of a trick question. The correct answer is B, B, R equals 0.9. And the reason it's B is because the R value has to fall between negative one and positive one. Okay, some people were saying E, R equals negative 1.2, but that can't be correct because that is beyond the limit. Okay, that is uh, beyond negative 0.1. So the correct answer is, is B, 0.9. Okay, it's gotta be within the limits. That was a little bit of a trick question. So watch out for that on the AP test. And number 59, we have parenting styles. Let's go through these real quick. A parent who is very supportive, but also imposes strong discipline is considered an authoritative parent. This type of parent often praises their child as much as they punish them. They often explain the purpose of the punishment. These children tend to be more independent than uh, uh, 
than not. Okay. Now, here's a great example of correlation is not causation. Okay. Just because someone doesn't have an authoritative parent doesn't mean they're doomed to, you know, a terrible life or anything like that. Next up, we have authoritarian. And the way I like to remember authoritarian is authoritarian, uh, I think authoritarian, totalitarian. Okay. Totalitarian dictators are super strict. Okay. Now I'm not comparing authoritarian pa uh, parents to totalitarian dictators who are awful and evil, but think of the strictness and think of how totalitarian and authoritarian end in the same uh, uh, ending of the word. So authoritarian parents, authoritarian parents have strong discipline. They will all often uh, not tell the kid why they punish them. They will say to the kid, oh, you're being punished because I said so. They're very strict. They often don't give the kid a lot of autonomy. The parent often makes decision for the decisions for the kid. And as a result, authoritarian children, sorry, authoritarian children tend to be more susceptible to peer pressure. And then you have very supportive parents with weak discipline. This is the permissive parent. This type of parent makes few demands of the child. They often give into what the child wants to do and may try to be best friends with the child. And then lastly, we have neglectful, which is pretty self-explanatory, little support and weak discipline. All right, and number 58, we have Freud's defense mechanisms. And these are used to relieve anxiety, okay? We have Freud's defense mechanisms and they are used to relieve anxiety. Um, we don't have enough time to go into all of them here, okay? But if you would like, you can take a screenshot and you got examples of each. Now, one thing I do want to note is that with repression, the idea of one blocks or banishes memories from one's mind, it used to be thought that this was very common, that a lot of people went through some sort of childhood trauma, trauma or abuse, and therefore they repress those memories. But in reality, we have found in more recent years that it's actually not that common. And here is part two of Freud's defense mechanisms. I'll give you about 15 seconds or so to take a screenshot of that. So go for that. Go ahead and take a screenshot. All right, let's move on to number 57, Kohlberg's moral development. Now we're gonna go through this real quickly. So Kohlberg has three levels, pre-conventional, -pre -conventional, conventional, and post-conventional, and then a bunch of stages with each of these. So the first stage, level one, stage one, is the obedience and punishment stage, the obedience and punishment stage. And here a person makes moral decisions that are based off trying to avoid punishment and negative consequences. So maybe a parent tells a kid, hey, you can't have a cookie, don't eat a cookie right now. And a kid at this stage would think, hey, I shouldn't go get a cookie because my parents are gonna put me in timeout if I take one without their permission. They're all focused on avoiding punishment. Or maybe a man shouldn't steal because he'll get in trouble, obedience and punishment. Next up is individualism and exchange. This stage is all about what's in it for me. A person makes moral decisions based off of the question, what's in it for me? So it's also based off of the cliche, if I scratch, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. What's in it for me? You help me, I'll help you. So for example, let's say that Billy has a bunch of tests coming up on the same day. And Billy knows that one of his classmates, Sarah, has cheated off him before. So Billy believes it's okay to cheat off Sarah this time around as a means of returning the favor. That's what the reciprocity and exchange um, topic is all about. Sorry, that froze up again there. All right. Level two, stage three is the good boy, good girl stage. This is where an individual makes moral decisions that are based off of what others think. You know, what will my friends think if I do this? What will my family think if I do that? And this brings us to Kohlberg's made up scenario called the Heinz Dilemma that he would give his subject. So in this Heinz Dilemma, in this scenario, this made up character named Heinz has a wife who was terminally sick. And as it turns out, there's a doctor who creates this miracle drug that could save 
Heinz's wife's life. However, Heinz can't afford the drug. It's too expensive. So then Kohlberg would ask his participants, what should Heinz do in the scenario? Should he let his wife die? Should he steal the drug or something else? And from their answers, he would categorize his participants into the stages of moral reasoning. So someone in the good boy, good girl stage might respond, might respond, Heinz should not steal because his friends and family will judge him for stealing. Or they might say, hey, it's okay for Heinz to steal because what kind of person would let his wife die? A good husband will take care of his family. Next up, we have the law and order stage, level two, stage four. And this is where people make moral choices based off of society as a whole, not just close friends and family. In other words, it's wrong for Heinz to steal the drug because it's against the law. And that's what people may think. And laws are needed in order to have society function properly. The level three stage five stage is the social contract, which is, if you remember from American government or American history, a social contract is where we give up some rights to the government in order to have others like our natural rights to life, liberty, and property protected. So for example, we give up our ability to go hundred miles an hour down the road so that our lives are protected via safer roads. So typically speaking, individuals at this stage really don't wanna break the law because they believe laws are good and important. However, they also believe that laws should be changed through the democratic process, not through civil disobedience. But there are times or occasions where laws should be broken, such as where one's natural rights are at stake. So in this case, um, people with this type of moral reasoning would say, hey, Heinz should steal the drug to save his wife's life because her natural right to life is more important than the consequences he might face for breaking the law. And then lastly, you have level three, stage six, the universal ethical principle stage. And this is where individuals tend to recognize the necessities of laws. Laws are important and the democratic process is good. However, the democratic process doesn't always lead to the changes necessary to protect individuals or groups. So therefore, civil disobedience can and should be used to bring about change. So individuals who would fall into this stage would be like Martin Luther King Jr. or Rosa Parks, who fought for African-American rights in the United States. I'm not gonna go into it now, we gotta keep moving, but I also recommend checking out the criticisms of Kohlberg, because that shows up from time to time, criticisms of Kohlberg. At number 56, we have Piaget stages of cognitive development. And let's real quickly knock these out. So the first stage is the sensory motor stage where a child experiences the world through their five senses. And by about eight months, kids start to develop what is known as object permanence. So in other words, a kid prior to eight months, when they see, um, when they see this ball here, if, they, if you were to hide the ball from them, they would think that the ball just disappeared from existence. They don't have object permanence yet. But by the time they develop object permanence, if you hide the ball from them, they will realize, hey, the ball is underneath there. So if I just pull this off, I can still find the ball. So that happens at about eight months. At about the same time, kids develop stranger anxiety. This is at the same, roughly the same time they start to move and crawl. In other words, they don't wanna be held by someone who isn't like the parent or guardian or someone they don't know well. And that brings us to the pre-operational stage where kids begin to use words and images to represent objects, ideas, events, and feelings, such as like, hey, that's a hot stove. That's a soft puppy, I'm mad. That's, you know, examples of what that means. Kids at this stage use pretend play, which is pretty self-explanatory. So for example, my kids think the couch is like the fire, a fire truck or a spaceship, or they like to pretend that they're superheroes. And then there's also animism and artificialism at this stage. Animism is the belief that inanimate objects have human feelings and thoughts. So if a parent knocks a teddy bear by accident off a chair, the kid might go, oh, you hurt the teddy bear. Or they may say, hey, my doll or action figure is hungry. They want to eat. Or if a child trips on the sidewalk, the sidewalk is mean. Next up, we have artificialism, which is the belief that parts of the environment are created by people, such as like if there's thunder going on outside, a kid may believe that someone's angry and stomping their feet, feet and that's what's causing the thunder. Or the clouds are white because someone painted them that way. 
And lastly, in this stage, you have egocentrism, which is where a child assumes that other people experience, they see, they hear, they feel emotionally, they experience the world in exactly the same way they do. So for example, let's say a dad calls home and their little kid in the pre-operational stage picks up and the dad goes, hey, hey, um, Sarah, is mommy home? And Sarah goes, and the dad goes again, hey, Sarah, is mommy home? And the kid goes, okay. And once again, the dad asks, hey, is mommy home? And Sarah's like, dad, I told you already. Well, that's egocentrism. Sarah, in this case, assumes the dad can see exactly what she's doing when in reality he cannot. And after that, you have the concrete operational stage where kids begin to understand conservation and use basic logic. So here we go. Here's a quick example of conservation. So first off, conservation can be defined as the awareness that physical quantities do not change in amount when they are altered in appearance. And that's the definition according to the APA. So the classic example is right here, we have containers of liquid. And if you ask a kid prior to the concrete operational stage, hey, does glass A or B have more water or do they have the same? And the kid will respond, yeah, obviously the same. And then what they do is they take in front of the kid, right in front of the kid, they take the water in glass B and put it in glass C. And then they ask the kid, hey, which has more water or do they have the same, A or C? And kids prior to the concrete operational stage, they don't understand conservation, will say, oh, C has more water. Okay, but once kids get to the concrete operational stage, they'll understand that um, physical quantities do not change even when altered in appearance. And there's others, other examples of this, not just with liquid, but that's conservation. Another thing that happens at this stage is logic the, during the concrete operational stage, which can be defined as where one draws valid conclusions after particular rules are laid out to be followed. Okay, so... The classic example is if A equals B and B equals C, therefore A equals C. And you have the rules below to come up with the answers to this, this phrase. So for example, all rainy days B are cloudy days, B equals A. Tuesday is a rainy day, so C equals B, therefore Tuesday C is a cloudy day, and therefore C equals A. So that's an example of logic. All right, and then lastly, you have the formal operational stage where kids begin to understand sarcasm, such as The Last Jedi was such a good movie. Now, sarcasm is where people tend to say the opposite of what's true, often at the expense of someone else. So that's sarcasm. Also at this stage, kids um, begin to manipulate information and objects in their minds without seeing them. So for example, this is not like um, psychic powers, but for example, this would be like doing math in your head. If you're calculating a tip in your head, you're uh, manipulating information in your mind without seeing that information written out in front of you. Strategy formation also develops at this age and strategy formation is planning out a course of action, especially when it comes to winning a game like Monopoly, chess, Fortnite, whatever it may be. Additionally, abstract concepts develop, at, or sorry, the, the ability to think abstractly develops at this stage, and abstract concepts are ideas that are not concrete or tangible. In other words, they cannot be experienced through the five senses. So, for example, abstract concept includes things like beliefs, principles, or emotions, such as like freedom, justice, honesty, truth, love, and hate. Those are all abstract thoughts that people can start to think about and understand at this stage. We also have hypothetical thinking, which includes what if questions that typically aren't based on reality. So for example, what would you do if you could travel back in time? That is a hypothetical thought. What would you do if you won the lottery? Another hypothetical thought. And then lastly, metacognition, which is thinking about thinking. An example of metacognition would be if your math teacher said, hey, why did you try to solve the problem this way? Um, and you go, well, I thought if I did this, and then I thought if I did that, it would lead to this. That's metacognition, thinking about thinking. And please note, as it says here, not every adult gets to this stage. And some people criticize Piaget for a couple of reasons. First off, 
They criticize him because they think he underestimates the ability of children, and some argue that children do not learn in stages, but rather grow continuously. All right, getting there. Five more guys. At number 55, we have Erickson's psychosocial development. Okay, think of the social aspect. So the first stage, real quick, is the trust versus mistrust stage. So at this stage, kids will either learn to trust the world and see that it's safe, or that it's unpredictable and that terrible things may happen. Kids may develop a sense of trust if the caregiver provides nutrition for them, protection, if the caregiver goes to them when they're crying or goes to them to change uh, their dirty diaper on a consistent basis. And in if these things happen, the child will see the world as a safe and predictable place. In other words, they will develop a sense of trust and have a hopeful outlook on the future versus a child who doesn't receive this type of care, they will develop mistrust, which may lead them to be mistrustful of developing relationships in the future, in addition to feelings of anxiety and insecurity. The next stage is the autonomy versus shame stage. And this is where kids want to do things on their own. They don't always wanna be told what to do by their parents. They wanna, you know, at the stage, pick out things like what they wanna wear. I want to pick out what toy I want to play with. I want to brush my own teeth. I want to tie my own shoes. I want to choose what to eat and things like that. So if children don't get a chance to choose these types of things on their own, or if they fail or mess up while they're doing these tasks, like if they brush their teeth and they spill toothpaste everywhere, or if they're tying their shoes and it's taking too long, this can lead to feelings of inadequacy if the parents step in and scold them for going, hey, I'll just do it. I'll just tie your shoes or why'd you make a mess? And so this leads to feelings of inadequacy. And as a result, a child may feel shame and develop low self-esteem. The next stage, the preschool age, is initiative versus guilt. And taking initiative means uh, where one looks to take action on their own or where one looks to take control of their environment. So at the preschool age, at the preschool age, kids, as we talked about with Piaget, pretend play. They make up games. Okay. And when kids pretend play, they assign roles and responsibilities to these made up games. And often kids will fight for who's in charge, who's going to be the leader of the group here in this make-believe scenario. And when someone kind of says, hey, I'm going to be in charge, that's an example of taking initiative. So for example, my older son, he likes to play Star Wars with his brother a lot. And oftentimes he'll make himself Darth Vader and he'll tell his little brother, hey, you're going to be the stormtrooper. He's taking initiative, and then he'll go and boss his younger brother around to tell him what to do. Another example of taking initiative is a child taking care of a pet or a toy or plant. So one other thing to understand at this stage is that if parents are too overbearing and they structure everything for their kid, that kid may never learn to take initiative on their own, or they may struggle with it in the future. Additionally, kids at this stage often ask why why are we doing this why are we doing that why 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 okay why does this work this way so if a parent doesn't answer these questions or just ignores the child the child may feel guilty initiative versus guilt for asking these questions in the first place so what a parent should do during this stage is they should praise their child for taking initiative but at the same time they shouldn't be overly critical when the child messes up and that leads us to leads us to the school age industry versus inferiority, where at this age, a child is learning how to interact with their peers at school, and they're also learning new emotional and social skills. And a lot of the things they do at this age are being measured against how other people are doing these things. So while kids interact with their classmates, they may discover, hey, I'm better at my classmate in this regard, and they're better than me in this regard. So when you do better than your peers, you're going to have feelings of industry or confidence based on their hard work and vice versa. For example, a child may feel inferior if they're not as good as their peers at sports or at school. And this can lead to feelings of inferiority and as a result, feelings of anxiety and depression. The identity versus role confusion stage in adolescence is pretty self-explanatory. It asks the question, who am I? Who do I want? Who do I want to become? Where do I fit in? How do others see me? You know, am I an athlete? Am I a musician? Am I an artist? Am I a loner? Should I become a doctor, an engineer? Who am I? What's my identity? Next up, 
during young adulthood, we have intimacy versus isolation, where one typically finds someone to settle down and enjoy life with, or they may end up being alone and isolated. The generivity versus stagnation stage in middle adulthood is all about leaving behind a legacy. So I may look that old, but I'm not in this stage because, you know, I may look that old because I'm bald. Uh, but an example of generivity would be leaving behind these YouTube videos for you guys to pass them off to the next generation. So leaving behind something for your kids or, you know, for if you don't have kids, someone else, that's an example of generivity. And then lastly, you have maturity, the maturity age, and the conflict there is integrity versus despair. And this is where one looks back at their life and says, did I do a good job? Did I, you know, do a good job leaving a legacy behind? Um, you know, am I happy with who I become? So it's looking back at the past and saying, did I meet the goals that I set out to meet? So there is Erickson's psychosocial stages. Okay, almost there, guys. Next up, number 54, we have Gustav Fechner's absolute threshold. And as it says here, this is the minimum amount of stimulation required to trigger the sensation of touch or taste or smell or vision or hearing. Or it can be defined as the smallest detectable level of a stimulus that you're only able to detect 50% of the time. So, for example, there are times that there are going to be stimuli in the environment that exist. They're present. However, you're not going to be aware of those stimuli. In other words, they're going to be below your absolute threshold. So, for example, maybe there's a bug crawling up on your arm, but you don't feel the touch of that bug crawling on your arm because it's below your absolute threshold for touch. So another example in regards to um, absolute threshold is in elementary school. I don't know if they still do this, but they used to give hearing tests. Okay. And what would happen is the person giving the hearing test would play sounds. And sometimes those sounds would be beneath your absolute threshold. So you couldn't hear them. They'd be so low in volume that you couldn't hear them. And then it would start to raise the volume level. And as soon as you could hear that low level sound, that sound would have crossed your absolute threshold. Another example might be if you were to sit in a pitch black room and a researcher slowly turned up the lights. So let's say this is your absolute threshold. They slowly turned up the lights on a very sensitive dimmer switch. At some point, those lights may be on, but the intensity of those lights is so low that you're not able to detect the fact that they're on. But as soon as those lights hit a certain brightness, you will be able to tell that they're on. And at that point, the brightness has passed your absolute threshold for seeing. And note, absolute threshold has this 50% clause at the end of it, which where it says the smallest detectable level of a stimulus that you're only able to detect 50% of the time. This 50% clause exists because there are going to be times, going back to the hearing test example, that we are able to hear that lowest level sound right at our absolute threshold. But there's also going to be other times we are not able to hear that same exact low level sound. And this could happen for a couple of reasons. Maybe you're not super alert. Maybe if you're really tired while taking the test, you might miss that low intensity sound right at your absolute threshold. Or maybe you're not motivated to care about the test. So you may not be really listening that hard and you may miss that low intensity sound that you would be able to detect if you were you know, paying attention. Also, our expectations and experiences can impact if we detect that minimum intensity stimulus. So be sure to add that 50% clause to your definition. I don't want you to lose a point there. And that ties us into, almost there guys, three more, the difference threshold, which says, which is the minimum change in the intensity of a stimulus needed to detect that a change has taken place. And we're only able to detect that minimum change 50% of the time. So in this case, unlike with the absolute threshold, we are already aware of the stimulus in the environment. So for example, let's say that you notice that the lights are on in a restaurant and you're going to a fancy restaurant, you notice the lights are on and at some point in the night, they dim the lights. If you notice that they lower the brightness or the intensity of the lights, then the lowering of the lights has crossed your difference threshold. Okay. Another example may be if you're at the school dance and you notice they turn up the volume or turn down the volume. If you notice that change in the intensity of sound, then it's crossed your difference threshold. So 
Please note that the difference threshold also has this 50% clause because it's the minimum change needed to detect that a change has occurred. So for example, if the volume of a song, the volume of a song is real low and then it gets real loud, it's gonna be very easy to notice the difference in volume. However, if the change in volume is very subtle, very subtle, then you might miss that change in intensity. So the difference threshold asks, what is the smallest amount of change, and in this case volume, what is the smallest amount of change in volume needed to notice that a change has occurred at all? Or here's another example, how much more salt would you need to put on your fries for you to notice that these fries are more salty? Do you need just a little bit of salt or do you need a lot of salt? And it's gonna vary from person to person and it also depends on the original intensity of the stimulus. And that's gonna bring us to Weber's law, but we don't have enough time to go into that. So I recommend checking out Weber's law in relation to psychophysics. Okay, almost there kids. Number 52 is the adrenal glands. And the adrenal glands are part of the endocrine system. Remember, the endocrine system is the body's slow messenger system compared to the nervous system, which sends messages or information really quickly. So the endocrine system, the body slow messenger system. Now, once again, you should probably know all the parts of the endocrine system. However, we're gonna focus on the adrenal glands here. So the adrenal glands secrete the hormones, norepinephrine and epinephrine, AKA adrenaline, which provide more oxygen to our muscles, which energize us to attack or flee. So adrenaline kicks in the fight or flight response. And that's important, you should know that. Um, so that is term 52. And there's more we could talk about with the endocrine system, but we are running out of time here. So on to the last term. I know a lot of you are excited to get to the last term. If this has helped you at all, please consider subscribing. And um, don't forget to check out the top 50 AP Psych review video. The link's in the description. And if this has helped you at all, hit that like button. And here we are, all stars. Hans Selye's general adaptation syndrome. This is term number 51. And this says that if there's a stressor, and here are some examples of stressors, like a family member dies, or a person finds out that they have a terminal il illness, or if someone gets fired from their job, those are stressors. That will activate, that will activate the alarm stage of uh, Hans Selye's general adaptation uh, syndrome. Sorry about that. So what happens when the alarm stage kicks in? Well, the sympathetic nervous system is activated. We've talked about that. What happens when the sympathetic nervous system is activated? Heart beats faster, heavy breathing, perspiration, etc. And also adrenaline is released in response to this stressor for the fight or flight response. Okay, the alarm stage eventually will lead to the resistance stage. And during the resistance stage, the body is trying to return to normal via the homeostasis process. And homeostasis is the body's default state that it functions at. So for example, if you're too hot, you're going to sweat to cool off. If you're too cold, you're gonna to shiver to warm up. Another example of returning to that homeostasis state would be like if you have high blood pressure, your body's gonna to try to lower your blood pressure. And for Hans Selye's rats, he tested this on rats. This kicked in about 48 hours after the stressful event took place. And what's going to happen is during the resistance stage, the parasympathetic nervous system kicks in, which kind of does the opposite of the sympathetic nervous system. It's going to calm your breathing. It's going to calm your heart rate. It's going to lower your uh, blood pressure. It's going to kick in to try to return you to that normal homeostasis state. Uh, but please note that some alarm stage effects will still exist during this time. And another thing to note is something from the college board here. The college board, let me move this out of the way. The college board wants you to know or wants you to mention that one's physiological arousal is still going to be heightened more than normal at this stage or that one's physiological arousal may begin to stabilize via the resistance process. Because sometimes the college board doesn't say, hey, here's all of Hans Selye's general adaptation syndrome. They might say, how does the resistance stage apply to the um, scenario? Or how does the alarm stage apply to the scenario? So for the resistance stage, the college board wants you to say 
this little note down here at the bottom. All right, and then what happens next is that the body's resistance can only last for so long before exhaustion uh, kicks in. So if the original stressor has passed, then your body's gonna continue to recover. You're gonna be all right. But if not, your body will no longer have the energy to deal with the stress over the long run, and it will begin to break down because it's used up so many resources trying to repair itself. And as a result, it can lead to a risk of ser serious illness, such as like stroke, heart disease, depression, high, chronic high blood pressure. It can lead to infections because your immune system is really weak. In other words, the ex exhaustion stage is just not good because your body begins to shut down. Whew. All right, guys, I know that was a lot. I know I went really quickly. You guys are all stars. I want to just give you a couple more tips um, before we leave about the test. But here it is. Don't cram. Don't wait till the last second. Spread out your studying. Use um, distributed practice. The spacing effect. Study in increments over time. You will be able to memorize things better. Another big tip is to know your researcher. Know your psychologist. Um, they will ask typically a ton. Of, not, a, not necessarily, but um, in recent years, it sounds like the College Board really wants you to identify, be able to identify um, psychologists and so it's really important to know who did what, who studied what. So know that inside and out. If you don't know a term, um, skip it, come back to it. You can still get a five if you miss a couple questions here or there and make the information meaningful, okay? Make the stuff you're studying relatable because you're more likely to memorize it, okay? So here you go. Here are some other terms that didn't make the cut, other terms for you to look at. You can take a screenshot of this. We're not going over it. Um, and so please take a look at this. These were on the bubble, but they did not make the top 100 cut, but they could probably be in here as well. So you guys are all stars. I wish you the best of luck on the test. I know we had to kind of rush there. There was a lot and this has been going on for a while, but I will catch you later. and. I hope you do well and dominate that AP psych test. I'll catch you later, all-stars.